But yeah, like Maggie said, if you are looking for your people, if you're looking for a group, go down, get plugged in. You can find one today. So we hope that you will go and, and do that. Uh, for the, the last two months, that pillar that I talked about last week that I tore out of our house, uh, that, la- that pillar for the last two months has been sitting at the edge of our driveway. I had no idea what to do with it. It was huge. I, I didn't think that I could just like set it down by our trash and they would throw it into the truck because I didn't think that it was actually going to fit, but I had no clue what to do with it. Um, But after setting up our new series last Sunday, I decided that it was time to take care of that pillar once and for all. And so I grabbed my sledgehammer and went to work on destroying this thing. And it was oddly satisfying, taking the sledgehammer and just breaking it apart. And, And I kind of transferred all of those pillars that I have put up in my faith that aren't in the blueprints. I transferred all of those things onto that pillar and I was like, taking it all out. What about you? Did you spend some time last week thinking about the pillars that you have put up in your faith that aren't in the blueprints or, or maybe those pillars that are, but they just feel outdated or in the way and so you've taken them out? out. My guess is that we all have them. And as we continue to look at this topic of deconstruction in this series, my hope is that we will have the courage to look at the pillars that we have either put up or taken down and and see if they actually belong. If we need to tear them out or if we need to keep them or put them back As a reminder from last week, deconstruction is the process of rethinking your previously unquestioned beliefs. It's typically triggered uh, by some kind of spiritual crisis or maybe a life event uh, where, where everything that you once assumed or believed or grew up um, being taught, all of a sudden there's a discongruence between those things and you start asking yourself, do I believe what I actually believe? Say I believe. Does, does scripture support what I believe? Or have I bought into the ideology of the church that I grew up in, my family of origin? Have, have I uh, allowed... The cultural influences to put up pillars in my faith or take them down. And today we are talking about a a topic that has caused so many people to rethink their previously unquestioned beliefs. A topic that is keeping many others from even exploring the Christian faith because of how they have seen the church handle it, especially over the last eight years. Today, we are talking about politics. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) That was the best one yet. Well done, guys. (laughs) It kind of feels like that, doesn't it? Uh, Like, I have had several conversations with people over the years tell me, Sean, you cannot talk about politics in the church. It is like the cardinal sin. It is almost as bad as bringing it up around the Thanksgiving dinner table. It is not going to end well. But my prayer leading up to this week is that we will be able to talk about politics today without getting political that we can talk about this topic and allow scripture to guide us without getting into the weeds of all of these things within politics that want to divide us. And so we are talking about politics for a couple of reasons. Number one, because scripture talks about it. And if scripture talks about it, then we have to talk about it too. We don't have the luxury of just saying, nope, don't like that, cut it out and remove it. No, we talk about it too. But we're also talking about politics in this series because it is an issue that is driving so many people away from the church. More importantly, it is driving them away from Jesus because of how they have seen the church handle it, especially the younger generation. In many cases, the younger generation is not leaving the church because they're more liberal or because they have rejected uh, biblical doctrines. They're leaving the church because of the way they have seen 
a sidle up to politics and politicians in a way that feels hypocritical. A recent Barna study found that of the younger generation who have left the church, only 21% left because they no longer believe in God. 48% left because of the way that they had seen the church get in bed with politicians. As Russell Moore puts it in his new book, Losing Our Religion, an altar call for evangelical America, he says they've seen the generation that told them character matters decide later that it doesn't. They've witnessed their leaders disgraced, scandals covered up, racial injustice minimized, and cultural wars prioritized over theology. And people young and old have seen all of the ways that the church and politics have commingled, oftentimes at the expense of the social issues that they care most about. Issues that our faith says that we should care about too. And so, yes, there are theological reasons why we should care about the life of unborn children. That is good and that is right. But there are also theological reasons for why we should care about climate change. Why we should care about the resources that God has entrusted to us. Why we should care about stewarding God's creation well. And there are theological reasons for why we should care about the immigrant behind immigration policies, social injustices, and the pain that it has caused. And people have seen the way that the church and politics have commingled around, listen, around certain theological issues at the expense of other theological issues. And it's made them question if we really believe what we say that we believe, or if we just kind of pick and choose issues based on our political lines. And so as Christians, how should we engage in the politics of our day? What should that relationship look like? And what are the issues that we should prioritize? Well, I am going to answer all of that and more in the next 15 minutes that we have together. <laughs> Probably not. But I do hope that we can get a little bit of perspective of how Jesus approached politics in his day and see if maybe there are some things that we can learn from that. And so if you have a Bible or a Bible app that you like to use, turn with me to, to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, we'll also have the words up on the screen. When it, when it comes to politics, I have, I have talked to both liberal Christians and conservative Christians who, who feel like God is on their side. Like they have the moral ground. And but when, as, as one article put it, in, unless a human system is fully centered on God, and no human system is, Jesus will have things to affirm and things to critique about it. The political left and political right are no exception. And Jesus would have good things and bad things to say about the two predominant parties in our political system. And yet both sides, there are people who want to grab the name of Jesus and say, no, he's on our side. But this idea of co-opting God to be on our side isn't new. In fact, even before his birth, people have been trying to politicize Jesus and say, no, the Messiah is going to be on our side. But in reality, what we see in the life of Jesus and in the Gospels is that he constantly frustrated the political leaders of all sides. He refused to fit into their teeny tiny little political boxes. And there were essentially three parties in, in Jesus' day. And, and we call them religious groups, but, but in this weird way that the theocracy that was kind of governed by the Roman Empire all worked out. Um, we, we say that they're religious groups, but man, there was a lot of politics that were mix, mixed in to, to them. And, and so you have the Pharisees that, that are on the far right, and, and they wanted to keep God in their politics 
On the far left, you have the the Sadducees and the Herodians who were ultra liberal in their theology and their diplomacy. And they would shout out to the Pharisees, Roman lives matter. (laughs) And the third party were the Zealots. And the zealots were passionate about Israel and its prosperities. Scholars refer to the zealots as the MEGA crowd because their motto was make Israel great again. Scholars said it, so it's got to be true. (laughs) And what we see in the gospels is that Jesus absolutely frustrated every single one of them. To the Pharisees, he was too liberal. To to the Sadducees and Herodians, he was too conservative. To the Zealots, he didn't care enough about restoring Israel and defeating their enemies. Jesus frustrated all of them because he was not interested in advancing their little political agendas. He came to build his kingdom in this world a kingdom that transcends human politics and is not confined by a nation's borders, let alone its political parties. In Matthew 22, we see these different politicians coming at Jesus, trying to to trap him. They disagreed on everything, but the one thing that they held in common was that Jesus was a disruption and needed to go. Matthew sets the scene like this in chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. The Herodians, um, the, so Rome controlled and occupied this area. Herod was, was kind of their uh, appointed official for, for the Jews. And the Herodians were the ones who carried out the dirty political work of, of Herod. And so they they went together and, and they said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay imperial tax to Caesar or not? And so we see the Pharisees and the Herodians, these two political enemies, become allies to trap Jesus. And after they butter him up, which is what all politicians do, they try to bring Jesus into the hot topic politically of their day. Jewish families were were paying as much as 50% of their income to Roman taxes. It was incredibly oppressive. And so if Jesus says, yes, it is good and right to pay your taxes, then he's going to get the crowd to move against him. If he says, no, don't pay them, then now they have evidence to, to prove that Jesus is against Rome telling people to disobey Roman law. And if he says, yes, it is good, but here's what I believe. Those taxes should be lower. Read my lips. (laughs) No more Roman tax. (laughs) All of a sudden, Jesus has become a political figure. He's entered into the political debate of his day and did exactly what so many people wanted him to do, which is politicize the messiahship. So no matter how he responds, he could end up in hot water. And so what does he do? Verse 18. Jesus, knowing their evil intentions, he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? I love that. (laughs) Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And so they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is on this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. And so they left him and went away. And so of all the taxes that, that, that were imposed by Rome, the one that was maybe the most offensive to the Jews was this, this little single denarius tax that they had to pay. And it wasn't because it was exorbitant. In fact, it may have been a day's wage, if even that. But that denarius that Caesar demanded 
had his image on it, and it was inscribed with the words, Caesar is Lord and high priest. And so it was a religious and political slap in the face from Caesar to make them pay that coin. It was a constant reminder of him saying, I am your Lord and your God. And so there was certainly disagreements about the taxes that they should pay, but that one had a little bit of a spiritual realm to it. And so Jesus is asked, should we pay it? And so he asked for a denarius, uh, which again would have had that image of Caesar on one side. And in that time, image implied ownership. And so Jesus is like, if Caesar wants his stupid little coin back, then just give it to him. But just as Caesar's image is on that coin and it implies ownership, God's image is on us and it implies that we belong to him. One of our values as a church is that we live like God owns everything. And we typically think about that within our possessions and our bank account, but it includes us. We live as God owns everything. His image is on us and we belong to him. And so their taxes belong to Caesar, but we belong to God. And so Jesus says, give your tax to Rome, but give yourself to God. Don't let your heart and your mind be consumed by the things of this world, but the things of God, the one to whom you actually belong. And with this one statement, Jesus rises above the political argument that everyone else is getting sucked into. And I think that he's able to do it because he understands, one, just how limited politics are compared to the kingdom that he is bringing to this earth. But two, he also understands how foolish it is for us to get worked up over politics and put our hope in politicians when we belong to God, when we are citizens of heaven and our hope is found only in him. And so what does all of this mean for us? Well, to answer that, I want to look at another group that is in our text today. And they are mentioned, not by name, but we can draw from, from the context that they were there, keenly tuning in to what Jesus had to say and how Jesus would respond to this question. We talked about the politics of the Pharisees and the Herodians that came to trap Jesus that day, but I think it's equally important that we remember the politics of those who are hearing him respond, namely his disciples. Within Jesus' inner circle of disciples, he had people from across the political spectrum. Right there within his group of disciples was Simon the Zealot, who worked against government. And then you have Matthew, the tax collector, who worked for the government. These guys were on opposite ends of the political spectrum. They would have disagreed on just about everything. And yet these political enemies have come together not to trap Jesus, but to follow him. And I think they show us that our alignment with Jesus and his kingdom must always exceed alignment to our political party. Our primary allegiance is to Jesus, and no matter how hard we try, he does not fit nicely into any of our political boxes. He never has both Matthew and Simon had to make political concessions in order to follow Jesus. And the same should be true about us. There ought to be places where aligning with Jesus means going against your political party. And if they are not in your faith and your politics then it means you've probably created a God in your own image that looks like you, votes like you, and is for and against all of the people and issues that you are for and against. You've created an idol. And you've made them on your side. 
And there are times when alignment with Jesus ought to cause misalignment with your political party. And so which one will you choose? It might mean that you vote one way, but then you allow your faith to inform how you think and act and feel about those issues that Jesus does not toe the party line. You choose to align with him and his kingdom above your political party. And so vote your conscience, but don't give your allegiance to anyone or anything other than Jesus In other words, care about politics without being consumed by them. And care about politics, but don't let them become an idol in your life. And care about politics, but but don't let it be the, the first pillar that people see when they look at your faith. And care about politics, but not at the expense of the people and the issues that Jesus cares about too. Care about politics, but know that God's throne is not threatened by the person who sits in the Oval Office. We think that politics are massively important, as if the fate of our nation and our world and even our faith hangs in the balance of the next election. But Jesus is building his kingdom through his church, not your party. And so care about politics, but don't be consumed by them. King David, who was pretty involved in the politics of his day, he writes this in Psalm chapter 20, verse seven. He says, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. And when you read that, you can just go ahead and hear some trust in elephants and some trust in donkeys. (laughs) But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. (laughs) We trust in the name of the Lord our God. And I think the reason why so many people have written off the Christian faith is because they have seen us trust in chariots and horses and donkeys and elephants more than we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They've seen the way that we have absolutely been consumed by politics. And maybe most of all, they have seen the way we have treated those on the other side of the aisle, those with whom we disagree. How we have become more interested in winning an election or winning an argument than winning a person to Jesus. And so give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but don't forget to give to God what belongs to God. His identity is firmly impressed on you. And so let that be the first thing that people see when they look at your faith. Let God's image in you be seen in the way that you engage in politics, in the proper weight of importance that you give it. And most of all, in the way that you treat those who are on the other side. I'll close with this today. Our our fifth grader, Nora, is learning about government in school right now. And so she brought home some assignments and and we were kind of looking through them and she's learning about things like the electoral college and and how there are um, traditionally red states and traditionally blue states and and this assignment that she had just um, uh, like a week and a half ago uh, was, was this. Write a letter to people who disagree about politics and give advice on how they can get along. (laughs) I love what she wrote. It starts, dear elephants and donkeys. (laughs) And she wrote that because because she's like, daddy, who should I write this letter to? And I was like, well, you could write it to elephants and donkeys. And she's like, no, that's dumb. Why would I do that? And then we talked about party mascots. And she's like, yes, dear elephants and donkeys. (laughs) There are a lot of things that you disagree on, like who should be president, how money should be spent, and the laws that should govern our nation. Some of the ways you could figure that out are by talking about it, or even listening to what one another has to say. (laughs) How novel, right? Jesus said to love your enemies and treat others the way you want to be treated. So you could pray for one another. Sincerely, Nora Green. <laughs> I can't think of better words. Yeah, praise God for that. <laughs> I can't think of better words than that. And so may your attitude and actions reflect Jesus in all things, including the way that you engage in politics. 
May your alignment with Jesus and his kingdom always, always exceed your alignment with your political party. May you strive to bring God's kingdom into this world more than you fight to get your party into office. And may you give yourself wholly and fully to God whose image is firmly impressed in you. God, thank you for how you love us, for your patience with us, especially when it comes to this topic. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we have, that, that we have neglected issues and topics and most importantly people that, that you care about because we've prioritized aligning with a party. Lord, may our alignment first and foremost be to you and may that inform everything else. May we not bow to any idol that is in our world. But may we only bow to you. And so Lord, I pray that we will care about politics, we will be involved in them in the way that, that, that you have called us to be as citizens in this earth, but that we will not forget that our true citizenship is in heaven, that we belong to you, and that you have sent us into this world to make your name great and to bring your kingdom a little bit closer to earth. Thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. You can hear the rest of this message just by clicking here. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to see more videos from Sherwood Oaks. Also, if you have a friend or family member who may find this video useful, please click the share button below. Thanks again and have a great day.